Okay, so the past few videos that I've been making have been super long and they've been interfering with my ability to touch grass recently. So we're gonna keep it short and sweet in this video. You wanna learn more about something that I mentioned? I've probably talked about it in a plethora of other videos. You can go watch those. But in this video, I'll be going over a handful of the best new ways to make gold during the high aisle patch. A lot of those gold methods are entirely new and thus require the high aisle chapter to be able to receive the new items. That being said, a fair amount of these gold strats are still available to everyone because they concern meta changes and events. Alright, let's get into it. One of the first things that I tend to do whenever I venture to the new chapter zone for the first time is complete some dailies while I'm there. The daily repeatable quests are a great way to gather gear to sell if it's valuable or deconstruct for materials and sticker book progression if it's dog garbanzo. At the time of recording, it's possible to receive the new steadfast society motif from completing the world boss dailies. I think we can expect the Delve dailies to have their own motif in time, as it seems to fall in line with the pattern that Sauce has been adhering to lately. Of course, these motifs, seeing as they're new, will be worth lots, although their prices will decline as more players complete these dailies and saturate the market. If you receive gear that is in the Steadfast Society style that you don't plan on selling, be sure to deconstruct it for this new, valuable style material. It's valuable because it's a necessary component for crafting the new high aisle furnishings. If you don't plan on using these Stendar stamps yourself, you can always sell them. And quickly, before we move on, remember how last patch Azoth stated that the Fargrave Guardian motif would be dropping from the Fargrave World Boss dailies, quote unquote, some time after update 33? They didn't end up dropping at all during update 33, but it looks like they sneakily added them to update 34. This notion wasn't mentioned at all in the High Isle patch notes for some reason, but yeah, the Fargrave Guardian motifs are indeed dropping now, so consider completing Fargrave World Boss dailies for a chance at receiving them. Speaking of patch notes, goofs, and gaffs, Zoss has continued their ongoing tradition of being very misleading with their wording on the portion of the patch notes that concerns the new ancestral motifs. Despite what it always says, ancestral motifs are not occasionally found while digging for antiquities. Please don't go scrying and digging shitting. <laughs> scrying and digging and shitting. Please don't go around scrying and digging shitty. <laughs> Please don't go around scrying and digging shitty green antiquity leads worth fuck all thinking that you might have a chance to receive a motif. You don't. Rather, leads for ancestral motifs have a chance to drop upon completing treasure map chests in zones that correspond with said motifs. So, the new ancestral Breton motifs can be acquired by first receiving a lead for them. You have a chance to receive these leads upon locating treasure map chests in High Isle. I have no idea why they don't just word this segment properly. <laughs> it's the source of a lot of confusion every time new ancestral motifs drop. I also think it's why some intellectuals have the gall to try and trick unaware players into giving them their supposedly worthless treasure maps for peasant change, when in reality, these maps are incredibly Incredibly valuable. The victims of these scams don't know any better. Be a good Samaritan and call this shit out if you ever see it, eh? Scamming's cringe. Another point worth mentioning is that the collector's edition maps for High Isle have a chance to drop these ancestral motif leads as well. If I recall correctly, this hasn't ever been the case before with CE maps, so I'm surprised that this was not mentioned anywhere. Definitely be sure to complete these maps if you haven't already, or list them on the traders for an adequate amount, considering how expensive ancestral brand motifs are. The new furnishing plans that drop from any new zone are always worth a bunch, given the fact that the demand for them is quite cracked. The supply is fairly low, and there isn't yet an option to roleplay as XQC and gamble with your RIP vouchers by purchasing furnishing documents from the Master of Dudes. The High Isle furnishings in particular are really lovely. They kind of remind me of the furnishings that debuted with the Blackwood chapter. Those Leowin furnishing plans, especially the purple ones, stayed expensive for a really long time until they got the furnishing document treatment, so I think it's safe to say that these similarly fashioned furnishings will subsequently remain pricey for the foreseeable future. 
Sora from the Tamriel Trade Secrets Discord server shared with me some of their favorite furnishing plan farming locations. The first one is the Castle Navir Nightswing. I found that the Knight's Quarters were really heavily populated with searchable containers, and it's where I've preferred to frequent for a chance at a couple new furnishing plans. The Master Meme, another TTS enjoyer, states that the Mandrake Manor is another solid place to farm for furnishing plans. There were definitely a fair amount of searchable containers in this spot, but I personally didn't appreciate how far apart they were. That being said, it's still another decent option for farming plans. If you're looking to pass the time before it's time for you to group up with the homies to go wipe in a trial for two hours, you should definitely try your luck at farming for these rare plans. Otherwise, be sure to passively loot containers as you're in the zone. A handful of events will take place in Update 34. Two prominent ones are the Zeal of Zenithar event, an event that focuses on crafting and fighting bosses with guildies, and White Streaks Mayhem, an event that revolves around PvP. I have comprehensive videos on the gold-making opportunities of both of these events on my channel, so instead of repeating myself, I'll just direct you to those videos for more information. A handful of new zone-specific paintings can be rarely obtained from opening up chests in High Isle and Aminos, including chests that correspond with treasure maps. Unfortunately, as of recording this video, the new gear sets don't seem incredibly valuable, so there isn't much of a desire to farm a regular chest in the zone. You're better off farming chests in zones that yield far more valuable sets that'll be a much more reliable means to make gold. But it is worth mentioning that you do have a chance at receiving these new paintings by partaking in this activity. As always, I recommend the following ESO YouTubers to keep up with meta changes and know what gear sets will be sought after. While there are many valuable sets out there, I'd like to chat real quick about some sets that will be experiencing an increase in demand and likewise price during this patch. The new craftable set, Order's Wrath, will be the quote-unquote go-to craftable option for DPS. Given the fact that it provides really solid stats and a unique crit damage bonus that can stack with other crit bonuses like minor and major force. If trial gear isn't yet an option for players, this set will do nicely. This set is going to be pretty decent in PvP as well. Because it is a craftable set, you don't actually need to own a copy of High Isle to obtain it. It can be crafted at any attunable crafting station that's been attuned to this set, and it can be sold on the guild traders. Fortunately, only three traits are needed to be learned to unlock the possibility to craft this set, so creating and selling Order's Wrath gear should be a fairly accessible means to earn a bit of gold via crafting. A noteworthy amount of PvPers have been gravitating towards the Griffin's Ferocity set. Whenever I see this set, I think of old iterations of Christopher ESO's wacky, very off-meta, but very entertaining build, Ghost. So I think it's really neat to see that after all of this time, this set is actually starting to seep into the mainstream. The reason why Griffin's is such a sought-after set recently is because it provides a great speed boost, something that's fairly integral when it comes to open-world PvP, as well as an easy access to minor force. This, coupled with the lines of crit that it provides, synergizes nicely with builds that are looking to build into crit damage, which seems to be the flavor of the month for this PvP meta. Griffin's also synergizes very nicely with another amazing and very popular PvP set, Rally and Cry. You may have heard of her. <laughs> Moreover, because the Serpent's Coil Mythic is something that a fair amount of PvPers are considering incorporating into their builds, the Griffin's Ferocity set can help alleviate the 40% snare that this mythic otherwise provides. Consider running content or completing dailies in Somerset for a chance at receiving this set. A craftable PvP set that I've heard more chatter about in recent times than usual is Nightmother's Gaze. Makes sense, considering the fact that it has lines of crit, and the 5-piece bonus has always been handy. Figured I'd mention it for those that prefer to craft sets to sell for gold. Plaguebreak is no stranger when it comes to these quarterly gold guides. It's no secret that it's a great set for PvE and PvP, although mostly PvP. I did just want to point out though that because new sets have been added to the ROTW coffers last patch, it is a little trickier to receive Plaguebreak gear from your Rewards of the Worthy compared to previously. 
This notion, coupled with the fact that a lot of players are rolling bow sorks this meta, many of whom are deciding to use Plague Break, has resulted in the prices of Plague Break gear reaching new heights, on my server anyways. On the topic of PvP real quick, a lot more PvPers are gravitating towards utilizing Bloodthirsty Jewelry instead of Infused, which was the more popular option for a fairly long while. This increase in the demand of Bloodthirsty Jewelry and subsequently the Bloodthirsty Trait Stone has resulted in a steady increase in its price. Given how easy it is for me to flip this Trait Stone, I get the impression that its increased value isn't widely known, so figured I'd mention it. You're welcome. And before we conclude with the gear segment, I did want to mention that Divine's PvP gear is increasingly becoming a sought-after commodity. While many may still associate the Divine's trait with PvE gear or with PvP ganking, there are a fair amount of players that are building into crit damage and running Divine's with the Shadow Mundus on a variety of builds, not just ganking ones. So don't list PvP gear that's in Divine's for cheapo prices, they're worth a whole lot more. Ah yes, my favorite MMO pastime, playing cards. Of course, I have to mention Tales of Tribute, the new gameplay feature that debuted with this chapter. When you win a match of Tot, you receive a nice little reward cache that can drop a wide variety of materials, including dragon materials which are pretty pricey. There are also daily repeatable quests that you can partake in to receive even more rewards, such as one that requires you to defeat three NPCs in different parts of Tamriel, and another that requires that you defeat three players. While you can hand these quests in only after defeating one opponent, you receive more reward caches the more peeps you defeat. Given the average duration of each taunt match and how silly some of the reward coffers can be, I mean, sometimes I get five valuable mats and sometimes I get actual garbage. I don't believe that playing Tot is an incredible gold earning strategy. There are much more efficient ways to earn gold if that's what you're actively seeking to do, but if you enjoy playing this card game and plan on doing so anyways, it's worth noting that you do have the opportunity to receive some pretty nice rewards from doing so. So you may as well pick up those quests and get the most out of your sweaty card PvP experience. You can even receive special leaderboard rewards if you partake in ranked, competitive top matches. I'm curious to see just what kinds of rewards we can expect from the different tiers of coffers. I know that a few gamers in the TTS Discord server have received some purple tribute victory coffers upon completing their daily ranked match, but some of those purple coffers yielded kinda crappy rewards, no different than some of the green coffer drops. Others received some purple furnishing plans from the purple coffers and even a Tales of Tribute tapestry from a blue coffer. Alright, that's all for this quarterly gold guide. Hopefully I've brought up a couple things that you may be able to fit into your ESO gold routine. As always, I'd like to thank my YouTube members for sponsoring content such as this and all of you for watching this video. I'll see you gamers in the next one. Cheers!